Welcome to Billionaire Romance Audiobooks. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps more than you know and is the best way to stay up to date on our latest releases. When you subscribe, you'll also get notified when we release new videos. The Surgeon's Secrets A Bad Boy Billionaire Romance Audiobook By Michelle Love Audio Copyright 2023 BFA Publishing Note, we edited this romance audiobook to comply with the YouTube content guidelines. If you want to listen to the full-length non-edited version, you can grab a copy from Google Play Books or Kobo. Blurb Dr. Damon Chase just saved my life, going over my doctor's head to perform a life-saving surgery. He's taken me from wondering if I'll die soon to looking forward to my life and I'm falling for him fast and hard. There are just two problems. The first one is that the medical ethics board won't look kindly on a senior cardiologist sleeping with any of his patients, let alone a college student just over half his age. The second is that Damon is a man full of secrets. I can sense it, but what can they be? And how can I get him past them so that I can have him in my arms? Samantha. Are you sure Dr. Carpenter can at least take a message? I plead with the receptionist on the other end of the line. I know he says that the verapamil takes some time to take effect, but it's been a week and a half and I can barely make it to classes. I'm sorry, the receptionist says in a bland tone that tells me she couldn't care less. But his voicemail box is full. He should be back from lunch at 3 p.m. If you can catch him before we close, he should be able to advise you. So when do you close? I'm trying not to get upset. The pounding in my chest will only get worse if I do. I try to distract myself by glancing around at the little stand of trees that surrounds me as I sit on a bench at the edge of campus. I started getting dizzy and sick again just walking up a slight incline for a quarter mile, and it scared me. We close at 4 p.m. She sounds disgusted, whether with me, her boss, or her job, I'm not sure. Thank you. I wish that I could reach through the phone and strangle her. Instead, I take a deep, slow breath and struggle to keep my cool as I hang up. I have to sit there a while, as the stress sends a fresh wave of dizziness through me. I'm barely holding back my panic, which I know will only add to the problem. Even then, a few tears roll down my cheeks. The pills aren't doing anything. I need real help and expertise. Not that cheap doctor. The problem started six months ago, bouts of painfully fast and sometimes irregular heartbeats with dizziness, weakness, and exhaustion. Dr. Campbell keeps trying different pills on me. But even high doses of beta blockers barely put a dent in my symptoms. My scholarship includes student medical coverage. Unfortunately, it's low bitter garbage, and Campbell is the only cardiologist in town who takes it. He and his receptionist team have a habit of treating me like dirt when I can least handle it. Just calm down, Sam. It will get worse if you don't. This is getting humiliating. In my freshman year, I was zipping around campus on my bike like it was nothing. Now and again, I would feel a little dizzy, but I was used to that. I've dealt with it my whole life. Then the attack started happening. The first time, I was just coming down for breakfast in the dorm cafeteria, ready to face my very last day of finals in my freshman year. I remember walking downstairs to the dorm lobby and stopping short, growing suddenly dizzy as my heart pounded violently. It's gotten worse since then. Now I shuffle around like an old woman and spend too much of the money I earn at my part-time job on cab fare to get home. I even had to quit my weekly swims. I can't even soak in the hot tub anymore, and that used to be my number one way to relax. But now the hot water will make me even dizzier as it drives up my already overactive heart rate. Dr. Campbell claimed recently that I'm not getting better because I'm not taking my meds. I had to get a test to prove to him that my bloodstream is full of the damn meds, they just aren't doing shit. His response was to try a different set of meds, which again, do very little. 
I get up and lift my art bag, an old gray canvas messenger bag covered in spatters of oil paint, smears of pastel and chalk, and smudges of charcoal. I've had it since I was 12, one of the few gifts I ever got growing up in the foster system. Right now, it feels like it's filled with bricks. My final class of the day is at 6, a night studio where all I have to do is stand there, paint, and try not to fall over. I don't even have to wrestle any of the big canvases today, it's all five-minute speed sessions on paper. I'll grab a light meal, drink something without any caffeine in it, go up the hill and throw on my smock. I'm feeling better after a meal and some fluids. I keep trying the doctor until four, but he makes no effort to return my call. He has other patients, the receptionist says without apology, while my heart beats so fast and hard it nauseates me. I wonder if this callous skank of a receptionist has ever gotten really sick in her life. If things keep getting worse, I'm going to end up in the emergency room again. I already have a huge bill from last month that I can't pay, and the prospect of facing yet another one makes my heart beat even faster. I agonize over that possibility while I sit on that bench and call Campbell twice more before his office closes. Tears start running down my cheeks after I hang up the second time, and I wipe them away sternly. Enough of that. I didn't get this far by giving up or feeling sorry for myself. I'll find some way to survive this, just like I survived foster care, public school, and getting myself into college on a full ride. But as I get up and start walking at a painful snail's pace toward the student center, I'm scared to death. I spend a lot of my time on campus alone. I'm kind of used to it. In school, I was the kid with no parents, who went home to an institutional cot and food that was marginally worse than the stuff in the dorm cafeterias. Making friends is a new skill for me. Here, at least, classes are so huge that nobody notices that I'm recycling through the same half-dozen outfits every week. But it doesn't make approaching people any easier. Still, when I get back that evening, completely drained and with paint smudges on my hands, I exchange greetings with a few people on my way up to my dorm room. The guard station in a lot of the dorm doors are decorated for Christmas, mostly cheap, printed paper decorations, tinsel garlands, and sometimes a string of colored or silver LED lights. The bulletin board on my floor is full of seasonal party announcements. I try to ignore them and just make it to my door. The sight of them tends to leave me depressed. I was lucky enough to have been assigned one of the rare single rooms. The room is tiny and plain, but it's the first private room I have ever had in my life, so I refuse to complain. It's not even eight, and I know that if I sleep now, chances are I'll end up getting up at some weird hour. But I can barely keep my eyes open, so I don't really care. It's bedtime. I leave my bag and clothes in a pile, pull on a huge purple t-shirt and shorts, and crawl under the covers, barely remembering to set my phone on the bedside table. If I sleep long enough, the pain in my chest may actually go away for a while. I wake up hours later to total darkness. I feel like a huge weight has dropped onto my chest. My heart is galloping like I'm running a race, making me dizzy and sick. I gasp and try to sit up, but it hurts too much. Oh my gosh, am I dying? I flail for my phone and almost knock it off the small table before managing to grab it. Every single heartbeat pounds in my head, my chest burns and aches, and the sides of my neck hurt, like my veins are going to burst. I manage to dial for help, but everything after that gets vaguer and vaguer. I give my name, location, and information about my heart condition, but it sounds like my voice is coming from far off, as if someone else is in control of it. It feels like I'm drifting further and further from my dorm room, out over a black sea, where the pounding of my heart is all I can hear. I hang on through sheer force of will as the 911 dispatcher keeps me on the phone and tries to help me stay conscious. The whine of sirens echoes toward me from afar. Then, the darkness closes over my head, and I hear rather than see my phone drop to the floor. Damon I'm dreaming about the night of the heist again, when my phone goes off and drags me straight up from the depths of sleep. One minute I'm jumping into a bank vault while the explosion drops the entire building around me, and the next, my eyes are opening in my posh Chicago penthouse and I'm fine. Except, of course, that my phone woke me up at three in the morning, and who wants to deal with that? 
I check the text and immediately sit up. Damn. There's a college girl in the ER with some kind of severe heart issue. Her cardiologist isn't returning his calls, and since I'm the cardio man on call tonight, it's time for me to hop to it. I leap out of bed and head for my closet, grumbling curses the whole time, but ready to get my game on. The new game. The one where I'm saving lives instead of chasing cash and trouble back in London. New game, new name, new identity, new life. And I have work to do. I text the desk nurse back as I take the elevator down from the penthouse. How are her vitals? She gets back to me quickly. Rapid, a regular heartbeat, with dizziness and pain in her temples, chest and the sides of her neck. She's diagnosed with congenital arrhythmia and tachycardia, the latter presumed to be anxiety-related. She's on a calcium blocker and a sedative. Arrhythmia. There are many kinds of arrhythmia, and it doesn't bode well that her doctor hasn't put an exact diagnosis on her chart. What's her electrophysiology study say about it? She hasn't had one. Her insurance barely covers the specialist, and her doctor wouldn't do it pro bono. She would have had to pay for it out of pocket. Which, of course, she can't do because she's a dirt-poor college student. Damn, I mumble under my breath. I step out of the elevator into the garage and head for my black prowler. I hate for-profit medicine so damn much. I slide into the driver's seat and text back. All right. Stop the calcium blockers, keep her calm, and introduce the following into her IV cocktail. I give a list of three meds I know they have on hand. We're going to need to do that study as soon as she is stable enough. We'll get it done. ETA. Ten minutes barring traffic. Whose name is on the chart as her specialist? I have my suspicions, but I still grit my teeth when she confirms them. Campbell. Damn. Adrian Campbell is the worst, most negligent cardiologist in Chicago. The two of us are colleagues, but every time I run into him at a conference, I want to punch him in the face. I've never met a man who mixes arrogance with incompetence as thoroughly as Campbell. He always has at least three malpractice cases pending, and he's hurt more patients than he's saved. That girl is as good as dead if she stays in his hands. Going to have to do something about that, I think to myself. I put my phone down and strap in, then start the engine and go roaring out into the street. It's chilly out, early December hasn't put snow on the ground yet, but I keep an eye on the road, wary of black ice. Chicago on the cusp of winter reminds me a bit of London, though the streets tend to be wider and more organized, and the weather's more changeable. Bits of rain spatter my windshield, making tiny distracting taps against the glass. The streets aren't quite deserted even at this hour. A few people fight the wind in flapping raincoats as I drive by. It's Christmas season again, which usually leaves me a bit melancholy. It's not like I can call my family back in London, let alone see them. The colored lights and the wreaths on the lampposts are just another reminder that I'm out on my own here in the States. I speed where I can on the way to the hospital, but keep it sane. I'm not some twenty-something idiot behind the wheel of my first sports car any longer. I just feel a strange urgency with this particular patient, maybe because she's young. Nineteen years old with heart problems. What a bad hand she has been dealt. Barely old enough to vote, and she's dealing with an issue most folks don't have to face until their sixties or beyond. I make my way into the staff parking section and ease the prowler into my space, making sure to lock up before hurrying over to the ur. My foot slips slightly on a patch of ice outside the entrance, and I bite back a curse. I rarely swear on hospital grounds. Morning, Dr. Chase. You're in early, Tom the security guard greets me. I give him a distracted nod hello. Emergency. Some 19-year-old girl's down with a congenital heart problem. Time to pop in and roll up my sleeves. 19? Damn. Well, I'm sure you'll be able to help her. He smiles and buzzes me in, and I hurry through. It's a slow day in the emergency department. The waiting room, with its slowly blinking lights and silver tinsel tree, only has two people, and though every treatment room is full, only one of them has nurses rushing in and out. 
I feel my heart sink when I see them scurry. You didn't code while I was on my way, did you, darling? Dr. Chase? One of the senior nurses, a skinny, bespectacled, older woman named Sarah, bustles toward me with an armful of files. Thanks for coming so quickly. She's down here. This is the only place in the world where a guy gets thanked for that. I keep my filthy thoughts to myself as I follow her to the curtained-off room for my first look at Samantha North. We've got her stabilized. She's been coming in and out of consciousness. We're prepping for the study now. We go in past the curtain, and I blink down at my new patient. Shit. The girl's half my age, vulnerable, likely terrified, and very much needs for me to focus on my work right now. But as I walk over to the bed and look down at her, I realize that focusing is going to be a bit difficult. She's a complete knockout. On the tall side, with milky skin, wavy red hair, full lips, and a body that looks good even in a hospital gown. Damon, get your mind out of her underwear and set to work on saving her life. I look over her vitals, then check her chart once Sarah hands it over. Question. Is her heart rate going back up no matter what drug is being used? Looks like it, yes. She looks over my shoulder at the chart, then turns the page and points to the EKG readouts. Sedatives helped some, and beta blockers helped some. The calcium blockers didn't seem to do anything at all. It could be worse than that. Some arrhythmias respond negatively to calcium blockers. That's why I had you stop them. The study will show us more of what is going on. I purse my lips and then hand the chart back to Sarah as I go on. It's possible that she may need laparoscopic surgery before this is over. I'll drive the scope myself. See if they can keep the operating room on standby after they run the study. She smiles and nods seeming relieved. How many times had she tried to call that damned idiot Campbell before she gave up and called me? Not too many, I hope. The poor girl stays unconscious through the entire test, just as well, since it involves threading a scope into her circulatory system. The procedure will only leave her with some soreness and a small entry wound, but the very thought of it gives a lot of patients the shudders. Still, it will save her from open-heart surgery, unless everything in her heart is completely messed up. I look over her chart, as we wait for the results, and I'm surprised to see an insert from family services from only two years ago. No family. Grew up in foster care. Started off life as baby doe after being found in an auto wreck that destroyed her presumed parents, but somehow left her without a bruise. No record of any distant relatives or foster parents. The facility she was in sent her to the same pediatrician until she aged out of the system, and to my relief, they've sent a copy of her medical records. Dr. Marsh did a much better job in tracking her health issues than the student clinic or, of course, Dr. Campbell. Reported incidents of lightheadedness back through the age of 10. Believed to be anxiety-related, but she has neither a formal anxiety diagnosis nor a diagnosis of PTSD. And yet doctors keep treating her for anxiety anyway, telling her that what she's been feeling since she was a kid is all in her head. If there's one thing I hate more than incompetent doctors, it's prejudiced doctors. The sort who go in assuming they know what's what because their patient is a fat guy, or a smoker, or a young woman. Everybody is different, and though certain types tend toward certain conditions, diagnosis and treatment are never one size fits all. The girl who's now resting in a nest of wires, sensors, and tubes, her heart still going too damned fast, needs precision as much as she needs empathy. I can offer both, though I can already tell that this one's going to wreck me if she passes. Occupational hazard. I accept it just as I once accepted that I wouldn't live past the age of 35. Half an hour later, I have my answers. I want to talk to the girl before we actually go in and fix the matter, so she knows what is going on. But I'm determined to do the surgery tonight, before Campbell can make any more of a mess of this. I have them lower the sedation level, so she has a better chance of waking up quickly and then have them watch her until she does. Not long after, they summon me back to her bedside. I walk in, putting on the best bedside manner I can muster before dawn and my first cup of tea. Miss North? 
I'm Dr. Chase, the on-call cardiologist. Her eyes widen as she takes me in. Even in the midst of her terror, I catch an ember of something I didn't expect in her expression. Time enough to discuss that later, though. Hi, she manages in a breathless voice. Hi there. I'm very sorry about meeting you under these circumstances, but I do have some good news for you, if you feel up to hearing it. I catch myself smiling a bit too much and dial it back, chastising myself. Good news is pretty welcome about now. I'm guessing I'm dot out of danger then. She forces a tiny, brave smile. I'm arrested by it briefly, then cough into my fist, trying to cover my lapse. Yes, well, we performed the test that Campbell neglected to give you, and I can now explain to you what is going on in your heart and how we are going to fix it. Oh. She makes the mistake of trying to sit up, and almost immediately stops, wincing in pain at the effort. Damn. Well, we haven't patched you up yet, so don't get too impatient to jump out of bed, I joke with her gently. She offers that brave, charming, little smile again. So, what's wrong with me? Her voice only shakes a little. It's called Wolf-Parkinson-White Syndrome. As you told our nurse that you suspected, it is not treated with calcium channel blockers, such as verapamil. In fact, they're contraindicated. They can make the situation worse. She's got one hell of a malpractice suit to bring against that jerk Campbell for his misdiagnosis and mistreatment of a life-threatening disease. I am so sick of his shit that I decide to help her if she'll accept the offer. We took you off the meds, and I want you to stop taking them when you get home. She nods quickly. Yes, doctor. Should I get rid of them? No. Keep them and decide whether you want to take legal action once you are feeling better. You can use them to support your case, since he put you on something that probably made things worse. I look at her and feel a stab of alarm as her eyes tear up. I knew it, she said in a shaky voice. I knew something was wrong. He and his staff weren't listening. I'm afraid that Dr. Campbell is somewhat well known for that. Unfortunately, those on campus health insurance don't exactly have their pick of specialists. She nods, still teary-eyed and before I can stop myself, I reach out and put a hand on her shoulder. She stops shaking at once and the water works slow. She looks up at me and smiles sadly. So what does this syndrome do, and how do we stop it? Well, the short explanation is that the heart has nodes that send electrical impulses through it and tell it when to contract. You happen to have too many of those nodes. They fire at their own rates, and for much of your life, they were likely firing almost in sync with one another. That means they were telling your heart to contract at the same time. That means for most of your life, your heart beat like a normal heart. Sometimes the two signals would get out of sync and you would get dizzy, but they likely always went back into sync with one another. But somehow this year, the two signals went out of sync, and now each one is telling the heart to beat at different times. And your heart is beating extra fast and unevenly, to keep up with what the signals tell it to do. I watch her face as she struggles to digest what, despite my simplifying it as much as possible, was a standard-issue doctorly info dump. She looks thoughtful, then raises her head to look at me. Okay. Thank you for figuring that out for me. Now, dot how do we fix it? Samantha I'm about to trust my life to the most attractive doctor I have ever seen, and I've had my share of medical emergencies. Holy moly though, this guy. Looking at him almost takes my mind off the fact that he's going to thread a weird robotic tentacle through my veins. He's got some kind of British accent, more working class than Oxford, but despite that, he looks Mediterranean. His wavy hair is almost jet black, and he has it pulled back into a short ponytail at his nape. He has olive skin, liquid brown eyes and a Roman nose above a wide, well-shaped mouth. He's tall and broad-shouldered under that white lab coat, and even in my drugged haze I can't help but notice that he moves like a panther. But most of all, he's got me captivated because he has the answers, because he cares enough to do his job right, and because he's about to fix my problem instead of just throwing pills at it. The surgical theater is small, and computer screens and equipment dominate one of its walls. 
I lie on the table while the anesthesiologist prepares my deep sedation. Meanwhile, Dr. Chase is walking me through what's going to happen next. Radio frequency ablation is not a long process. We already went in once to run the test, and it will be a simple matter to go in again. I'd estimate half an hour to go in with the laparoscope, and then we'll monitor you until tomorrow. That's it? You're telling me that I could be well by tomorrow morning. I can't believe what I'm hearing. No more pills? No more dizzy spells? No more being afraid my damn heart will give out? Well, more or less. You'll need to take it easy for about a week after everything you have been through, but normally this is an outpatient procedure. We'll cause the extra electrical node to stop sending signals using radio waves, and then you're done. He checks my vitals, then makes a few notes. Right, well, I should go get ready. See you when you wake up. The anesthesiologist, a tiny Filipino woman with graying roots, smiles at me and gives Dr. Chase a nod. All right, sweetie, I'm going to put this in your IV port, and it's going to make you very relaxed. You won't actually remember anything afterward. So, like when I got my wisdom teeth out, I'm nervous, but this is going to happen. It has to happen. And pretty soon, I'll be too high to care about what's going on anyway. Like twilight sleep, yes. She takes a syringe and slowly empties the milky fluid inside into my IV line. And here we are. Now, I'd like you to count back from 100 for me. Okay, I say, feeling a different sort of dizziness. A warm rush seems to be riding through my veins. 199, 98, 97. Ah. I wake up in a small recovery room, feeling a little bit of pain on the inside of one thigh. I'm sleepy and a little queasy, and the pain is completely gone except for that ache in my upper thigh. I lie there blinking, shocked by the loss of time and memory, even though I was warned. My heart is beating slowly as the monitor beeps along. It picks up as I notice it, but not by much. I don't hurt, I take a huge breath and my chest doesn't ache. I have no trouble filling my lungs with air, something I haven't been able to do in a long time. Intrigued, I press two fingers against my pulse to double check. It feels normal. Even. It's not racing at all. Holy moly. He got it. Dr. Unexpected actually fixed me. All I can do is lie there and stare at the ceiling for a while grateful tears leaking down the sides of my face. I'm not going to die. I'm going to be okay. And I have Dr. Chase to thank for it. The door opens and I look up, expecting a nurse, but it's him, and he's smiling like he's trying not to gloat. How are you feeling, he asks, his eyes twinkling. Much better, I breathe. Is that, is that it? Once you're discharged, I'll want to see you in my office in about a week. I'll make sure you're given an appointment card with directions. He puts his stethoscope in his ears and warms the business end with his hand before laying it above my chest. He smiles after a moment. Deep breaths. I oblige and he withdraws, nodding. Yeah, I'm 98% certain that this is sewn up. As is your leg, which may be sore for a few days. Thank you, doctor, I say, managing to stop my eyes from leaking again. I don't know what I would have done. I trail off because I do know. I would have died, and it would have been at least partly Campbell's fault. The thought sobers me a little, but not because it scares me. Now that I can think beyond the possibility of dying, I'm thinking about the possibility of suing. Don't think of it. You'll be fine now if you look after yourself for a few days. His voice goes from professional to almost tender distracting me from my growing anger. I sigh and sit up easily this time. He reaches over and adjusts the backrest for me. The little bit of extra care makes me smile, but it feels unnecessary. I already feel better than I have in months. I have to think about it though, I admit. Because I'm gonna go sue the crap out of Dr. Campbell once I'm well enough. He chuckles, and there's a dark gleam in his eyes now, intriguing me. I stare back at him, tilting my head, and he finally says, You know, I'm absolutely done with that idiot as well. Would you like some help with lawsuit preparations? My heart leaps. It has plenty of reasons to leap, 
he has healed it, he wants to help me even though he doesn't have to. Smiling I reply, I'd like that. Damon I can't wipe the smile off my face by the time I make my way back home. Saving anyone's life is always one for the win column, but Samantha, well, that girl is special. Too damn young for me, but I'm still pretty smitten. I know I'm offering help, because a part of me just wants to keep her around for a bit longer. And thanks to pure happenstance, I know that she wants to keep me around as well. The funny part is, I know she is quite interested, but I have doubts about taking advantage of that knowledge. I'm not supposed to know she's interested, that information slipped out while she was drugged. She got very chatty while sedated. Of course, she won't remember it now. Oh wow. Are you single? Do you want to go out with me now that I'm not gonna die? It was absolutely adorable. The nurses and my colleague, Dr. Pinoy, all giggled, and I grinned and acted embarrassed and awkward, all the while hoping no one noticed that I was hard as hell. And my expression made my staff giggle more. But I didn't say no, only that I would think about it. And I am thinking about it as I drive home, a lot. Being a doctor, I see a lot more of my patients than members of pretty much any other profession. Not just their guts or the insides of their veins, but more skin than most people would prefer, including me sometimes. And tending to Samantha, I saw quite a bit. I get back to the penthouse and start looking up pizza places. Chicago-style pizza is, without doubt, the best in the world. I order a large, all-meat, extra cheese, the sort I'd nag my patients about if it wasn't usually their sedentary lifestyle that was messing them up anyway. I'll burn off that beast of a pizza in the gym between today and tomorrow, which is about how long it will take me to finish it. I pour brandy into my tea, throw a dollop of honey into it, and settle into an overstuffed brown velvet chair in my living room to await my delivery. I've already told the doorman to receive the pie and how much to tip. I'll save my bottle of IPA to drink with my pizza. My schedule's off and I could use a nap, but I'm lucky to have nothing else going with work today until this evening. The only possible reason they'll call me in is if they need another emergency heart consult or fix, and that doesn't happen every night. I'm not needed for the average heart attack or gunshot wound. The pizza place is six blocks off and they know how much I tip, so I get my pie in well under half an hour. I'm setting it on the table and opening the box lid for that first whiff of scented steam when my phone goes off. Annoyed, I scoop it up and see from the screen that it's Dr. Campbell's office. Oh hell, I growl, already annoyed with the man, and especially so for his popping up now. Taking a deep breath, I force myself back into my doctor's demeanor and answer the call. This is Dr. Chase. May I help you? Dr. Chase. Campbell has one of those dull nasal whiny voices that never seem to change pitch much. I understand that you have taken over the care of one of my patients. I can tell he's annoyed even past his bland demeanor. It's all I can do not to grin. Yeah, I did, and she's going to sue you, and I'm going to help her. I'm sorry, could you be a bit more specific? The truth is, and he damn well knows it, that I am on call at the ER four nights a week because I spend so much time cleaning up Campbell's messes. His poor suitoring, inability to properly direct nurses, and corner-cutting have often left me fighting for the lives of his patients. I have even lost a few, which I despise him for, because all but one could have been saved if Campbell had done his job. Her name is Samantha North. Age 19, height 5 foot 7, red hair. You performed an ablation on her this morning at 6. Funny how he can rattle off details about her with no problem when he's feeling territorial, but he barely did a thing to help her when she needed it. Oh yeah, the college girl who turned up with Wolf Parkinson White. There is a long pause. I did not make that diagnosis. Right, well, that's because there was no electrophysiology study done on her. Otherwise, I'm presuming that you wouldn't have had her on the verapamil, since it's contraindicated for her condition. I am smiling a hard, predatory smile that makes my cheeks hurt. You and I both know you're incompetent and don't care to improve. 
I came up out of the gutters of London, a complete miscreant, and I care about your patience more than you do. I'm not anywhere near perfect, and I know it. He pauses again. I almost wish I could see his face. Finally he coughs. I see. So the ablation was done on an emergency basis? That was what they summoned me to the Ur for, yes. It's like he doesn't even realize how much of a fool he is currently making of himself. I wonder in a fit of charity if he's had his coffee yet. You realize that you are not in the system for her student insurance, so why did your assistant schedule her for the follow-up consult? I wince. I hate how much the damn nurses gossip and how far and fast that gossip spreads. I'm sure it's one of his receptionists funneling the information to him, as no one else can stand him. Nora scheduled her because I'm finishing what I started. I'll be taking her on pro bono. You'll no longer have to worry about anything to do with her. My voice is warm, friendly, and reassuring. I don't want him suspecting that I'm going to be helping Samantha bring down a load of karma on him. Oh. Well, fine. If you feel like taking one of my charity cases off of my hands, I'm not going to complain. Charity case? That pisses me off for some reason, and I bite back a response. Forcing myself to calm down, I smile again and keep my tone so sweetly pleasant that he'll miss the bald-faced lie. Yes, this should be the last you hear about her heart issues, except for a note for your files. Thank you for the reassurance, he says obliviously and hangs up. That and the fat lawsuit you'll be facing once I help that girl get everything together, I swear as I set my phone back down. I can't wait to see his face when we nail him on this together. I'm good and angry when I go back to my tea, which has cooled too much. I take a few tepid swallows and scowl, thinking hard about what I will need to do to help Samantha build a case. But before I can grab myself some pizza, I catch a glint of light out of the corner of my eye. My head swivels on instinct, and my eyes fix on the high-rise parking structure across the street. Its top floor is level with my penthouse, giving me an easy if distant view of it. There's a man standing at the front edge of the parking structure, up against the railing, facing me. All I can tell about him is that he's big, even taller than me, and dressed in dark colors. I catch that gleam from him again, but before I can go for my telescope or the binoculars hanging over the mantel, he turns and starts walking away. He walks with a slight limp, and I'm left wondering if it was just coincidence or something else. Samantha I can't get tired of taking my pulse, or walking fast, or taking huge breaths of air. My upper thigh hurts on one side where the scope went in, but I don't care. I'm recovering fast, dot and completely. It's like Dr. Chase flipped a switch inside me. I'm all smiles. I'm brimming over with joy and vindication. I'm full of defiance as well. I found the right man for the job, he fixed the problem, and neither one of you is going to see me until I'm damn good and ready, except in court. I want to dance my way out of the hospital entrance and past the big tree loaded with charity envelopes. I settle for a fast walk, amazed at how my heart doesn't race. I'm going to live. It's five in the afternoon, and the long twilight of early winter is starting to stretch the shadows out around me. A golden tinge of sunlight shows through the low clouds. The wind bites and I shiver, my delight dampened a little by reality. I have no shoes except for the slipper socks provided by the hospital, no coat and no money for a cab. I pause under the overhang and flinch back from a gust of wind. Oh crap. The hospital is at least 20 blocks from my dorm, and it's 45 degrees out. I might make it, but it's going to hurt, and I'm fresh out of the hospital. If only I'd been able to grab my wallet, on my way out of the dorm on a stretcher. But I wasn't conscious. Before I can brace myself to take my first steps home, I look up, and to my surprise I see a black prowler driving toward me. It pulls up at the curb and the window slides down, revealing Dr. Chase leaning toward me from inside. Bit cold for stocking feet, he says with a soft smile. Now the flips taking place in my stomach turn a lot more pleasant. I walk up to the car and can't help but smile back. Yeah, I could use a ride home. His smile widens without looking predatory. 
Get in then. The way I grew up has given me a good radar for creeps, and it's not being set off, so I open the door and slip into his passenger seat. It's warm and dry, and the seat I settle my back against radiates heat into my muscles. Thanks. That's another one I owe you. I sigh in relief as I buckle up. I'm in the dorms. I'll direct you. Are you particularly eager to go back there? Though if you wish to rest up alone, I can hardly blame you. He glances at me curiously before pulling away from the curb. I lift an eyebrow, wondering about his alternative. I've been sleeping for hours. I'm just starved. I want to load up on grease and protein right now, even if it isn't the healthiest choice. Do you like all meat pizza? He asks, and I shoot him a surprised look before nodding. The corners of his eyes crinkle. Good, because I've one I can pop in the oven if you'd like to come by. I ordered it for myself, but then I got busy with paperwork. Don't tell me you have details for this malpractice suit already. My eyebrows go up. This guy must really dislike Dr. Campbell if he's this dedicated about my lawsuit. Actually, yes. Just some starting stuff, but he called and made a bit of a nuisance of himself, and after that and what you went through, I was more than a bit motivated. He pulls out of the lot and into traffic. For a moment, his tone turns grave. You're not the only person he's nearly finished with his negligence. So he's the anti-you, then? Campbell seems to be pompous, aging, incompetent, and lazy. Whereas Dr. Damon Chase is amazing. Pretty much, yeah. He snorts. Believe me, even if I didn't like you, I'd still want to see him lose his license to practice. The man's a menace with a scalpel, and he's even worse with prescriptions. So you do think that I'll have a case? A mix of anger and hope boils inside of me. He smirks. Easily. The man's negligence could have finished you, or at best, left you with permanent heart damage. He's been sued 16 times for malpractice and settled every time. 16 times? I shudder and focus on the hunk next to me to get my mind partway off this horror. How was he allowed to keep practicing? Yeah, that I know about. He purses his lips. Look, I'll make you a deal. I'll clear out time a few evenings a week, pick you up, and handle dinner. We'll get together after your classes and go through everything needed. In return for my help suing that prick, I am going to ask you to put in a complaint with the medical board. The more of those he gets against him, the sooner he will lose his medical license and will finally see the last of him. He winks at me and I nod back, feeling my determination intensify. I don't want him to be able to screw up anyone else's life like this. And I want some of my own back after what he did. This isn't okay. My voice breaks a little. No, he replies, jaw set. It shouldn't be allowed. We drive. My heart is beating fast, for a reason now, and it doesn't hurt. If anything, this rising excitement makes me feel even more alive than before. So how are you doing after resting up? I haven't gotten a chance to look at your discharge file. He deftly maneuvers the powerful car through traffic. How long did it take him to sort out driving on the other side of the road, I wonder idly. I beam. I feel like I could run a damn marathon. I'm serious. He looks over at me before heading for the highway on ramp, his lips quirking. Well don't. Or at least wait a week. I will. Don't want to mess up your work. Besides, my thigh feels like I banged it on the corner of a table. I rub it gently through the hospital pants I left in. That's completely normal. And I hope you're finding it better than open heart surgery. He winks, and that makes me laugh a little. It's true. The old way I'd be in recovery for a long time, right? That and well, it gets a bit gruesome, but you'd need an entire blood transfusion by the time we sewed you up. He merges us onto the highway. I look over and see the gold and pink setting sunlight sparkling across the rippled surface of the lake. I'm really glad you have a better way now, then. I just look. I owe you a lot, I start, trying to walk around the issue of how fast I'm becoming infatuated with him. 
I want to tell him how grateful I am, I've already learned that life is too damn short. You owe me nothing, he cuts me off firmly. Look, is Samantha all right? Yeah, I say after a brief hesitation. You can call me Samantha. I can feel myself blush shyly at this new familiarity. Good. Damon's fine here. Look, Samantha, this is my job. Also, I don't feel like this will be over for you until you get some justice. I understand conflict's stressful, but what Campbell put you through was more than just stress. He moves the prowler into the fast lane and starts whipping along, a hair faster than the cars around him. It's thrilling to sit in the passenger seat of a car like this and hear the engine revving under me. In a way, my life's in Damon's hands again, and the thought unexpectedly turns me on. I squeeze my knees together, eyes widening as I realize another thing Damon has done for me. The ride feels too short before Damon pulls us into the underground parking lot of a gorgeous, modern, high-rise apartment building. I stand close to him as we ride up the elevator. He's wearing a little cologne. Something spicy, bay rum, I think. I still don't feel tired. It's amazing, I murmur, leaning back against the mirrored wall of the elevator as it rises toward the 25th floor. I really think I could stay up for hours longer. I can't remember the last time I felt like this. Technically, you won't have. Even if the effects of this anomaly didn't fully manifest until six months ago, it still detracted from your quality of life. But mild discomfort and problems one can get used to. The level of pain and debility you were experiencing the last couple months, however, couldn't exactly sneak by forever. Surprisingly, no one else gets in the elevator on the way up, and I hope no one does. I'm happy standing in an intimately small space while alone with him. No kidding. I was pretty terrified. It felt like I was dying. Well, he hesitates a moment as the elevator comes to a stop at the top floor. I didn't want to bring this up until you were fully recovered, but I stare at him, my eyes widening slowly. Then you really did save my life. Just don't think you owe me anything for it, all right? Saving you was my job. It doesn't imply you have a personal debt to me. He keeps emphasizing that. I wonder why. Hey, look, I'm just still coming to terms with this. I know it's your job, but Campbell didn't do his, and it could have hurt me. I know. It's just that when I'm helping with your heart issue, or any other time I'm wearing my doctor's hat, it's not a favor I'm doing you. This bit with dinner and legal stuff, that's a favor. But not the surgery. You deserve to have someone competent fight for you. There's something so grim in his expression that I wonder if someone has given him trouble for helping out patients in the past. Or maybe he thinks I'm worried that he will take advantage in some way. Either way, I'm smart enough to step carefully around the subject if it's a sore point for him. Sorry then. No, it's all right. I'm happy that things went well and that you're excited about it. His voice goes warm again as we walk off the elevator and into the tiny penthouse lobby, which is decked out with a beautiful skylight ceiling. I want so much to tell him that I'm getting just as excited about spending time with him as I am about finally being healthy. But when he finally opens the door to his sprawling penthouse, all I can do is stare. Samantha Polished wood paneling lines the walls along with an entire wall made from reinforced glass that runs the length of the building on one side. Saddle leather couches in deep brown face an entertainment center that dominates most of a side wall. A balcony enclosed in glass runs all the way around the building, from what I can tell. Wow. Other than that, I'm speechless. His grin is a bit embarrassed. Yeah, well, I grew up in public housing, council flats, we call them, one of the nastiest areas in all of London. I promised myself I'd get a nice place once I got older. He pauses, then shrugs a bit. I don't spend much on luxuries outside of the place itself and my car, so I figure I can indulge myself. I'm not complaining. This is lovely. Not much in the way of Christmas decorations, aside from a pine and holly wreath over the entryway that adds a nice odor to the room. 
I noticed the fancy gas fireplace in one corner and walked to it, extending my fingers to its warmth. There's a single photo on a mantle otherwise dominated by geodes and fossils, and I take a look at it. It's smallish and old, probably thirty years, and creased at the edges behind the glass, as if it was carried in a billfold for a long time. In it, a chubby, gentle-faced woman with curly russet hair stands in a small shabby living room with a crucifix on the wall. She wears a cheap blue flower print dress, and wraps an arm around two small but already burly boys in ill-fitting gray school uniforms. The boys have a similar look to them, one is stockier and thick-featured, with small black eyes and the same must-wavy black hair as the other, who has familiar liquid brown eyes and an easy smile. I look back at Damon as he approaches, smiling at him. Is this your mom? He looks serious suddenly, and my impulse to tease him about having been a really cute kid dies as he stares wistfully past me at the photo. Yeah, that's my mom and my cousin Copper from way back when. They're gone now. Oh. Awkward. I'm sorry. Not your doing, sweetheart. I'll pop that pizza in the oven. Like a cup of tea. He's already headed for the kitchen, which is visible through an archway at the far end of the room. Yes, thank you. To my surprise, he pulls down a lacquered black tray and a very pretty purple clay teapot. That's nice. Chinese? Yeah, Yixingware? I brew it with black, if that's all right. He starts digging into the cupboard for a tin, glancing back at me. That's fine, I reassure him. I'm not even much of a tea drinker, as I find it bitter and watery, compared to a mocha, which is my favorite hot drink. But I don't mind trying his tea if it gives me something to drink with him. He looks a bit distracted, as he puts together the tea service, and puts the kettle on. I watch him work, precise as always, his giant hands moving as deftly as a butler's as he slices lemons, pours cream into a tiny pot, and sets a little bottle of brandy on the tray. I've never seen a big masculine man use sugar tongs before, but he does so without hesitation, sleeves half rolled up. Have a seat on the couch. I'll be right there, he instructs, pointing me in the right direction. I wander obediently to the gigantic, deeply padded thing covered in saddle leather. I settle into it with a sigh, glad for some comfort, after dealing with the thin hospital mattress for most of the night. The couch is very comfortable, wide enough to sleep on and deep enough to sleep too. Or do all sorts of things together that I haven't actually ever done, but suddenly want very much to do. With him, we keep up a steady flow of small talk, getting to know the basics about each other. My work at school. His work at the hospital. Neither of us having family anymore, not that I ever had any to begin with. We talk and talk and he pours me some tea. I drink it with everything, the milk and honey smooth and sweet on my tongue. When the pizza comes out of the oven, dripping with cheese and steaming tomato chunks, it's the best thing I have ever tasted. But I can't stop watching him and wondering, what is it about you? We're both on our third slice when his phone goes off. He glances down as it lies on the coffee table in front of us, and sighs. Humph, hang on. I keep getting calls from people who aren't on my contact list. Local. I dab at my mouth with a paper napkin. He checks, dot and then for reasons I don't understand, he goes a little pale. London. He picks it up. Hello? He frowns and sets it down after a moment. They disconnected. Odd. But his troubled expression tells me that he finds it a lot more than odd. I don't ask about it, and after a while we start talking about the lawsuit, which he promises me is about as cut and dried as these things come. He'll settle for a large sum. It's how he's able to keep the spotlight off of himself, a big fat check that he tries to use to buy silence. Thing is, he can't make your approaching the board into a condition of the settlement. That's a different matter from the lawsuit altogether. He smiles and pours me another cup of tea. It's actually good, making me wonder what trick he's using to keep it from being so bitter. Shaking thoughts of the tea from my head, I focus on how I have to tell him of my interest, I have to say something or I'll always regret it. But I keep hunting around for the right words and coming up with nothing. Is something wrong? He asks after a while, as if he's sensing my struggle. 
I dot was wondering something, I admit nervously. My fingers twine together between my knees, and I squeeze them hard enough that the knuckles go white. I've never done this before, and it feels like the long, ticking climb to the top of a roller coaster drop. You can't date your patients, can you? I don't know how I get the question out. I blush at once, embarrassed at myself and worried that I'm about to be shown the door. Damon I can't help but grin at her shy little question, and that only makes her blush more and cut her eyes away, squeezing her hands between her knees again. Gosh, she's so cute. Well, I've got good news and bad news on that score, sweetheart, though I admit you may not think as well of me once I tell you. You're married, she asks worriedly at once. I laugh and shake my head. No, nothing like that, I promise. The Medical Ethics Board has a problem with doctors dating past patients, and a real problem with doctors dating current patients. I hesitate suddenly. There's another reason she might not want to get close to me. I've done my best to cut ties and leave my past in London in the past, where it belongs. But I absolutely hate lying to women. It always ends badly, but in this situation, I don't even know where to begin telling the truth or how much is safe to tell. Well, sweetheart, my mum isn't dead and neither is copper. The first one, I will never stop feeling horrible about, and the second is so he doesn't find me and get rid of me. We were both raised up in the family business, you see, and the family business is larceny. You don't abandon the family no matter what happens, even if staying in the business is finishing you. But I had to go, and thanks to a total accident, I got the chance to make a way clean with a small fortune. And if I tell you about how I hurt my mum and Molly by faking my death, well, if the fact that I'm a thief and a killer doesn't drive you away, that probably will. I don't bring it up yet. I don't want to end up pushing too much upsetting stuff on her all at once. Instead, I let the medical board matter sink in and watch as she frowns slightly. So you could be fired. She sounds worried. Censured certainly, fired possibly. With men like Campbell around messing things up, I imagine they'll give me leeway just for cleaning up his messes. But. I lean back in my seat next to her. I have barely touched her yet, but now that she's brought this up, it's a real trial to keep my hands to myself. But what? I mean, I don't, I don't want to get you in trouble. Her pale gray eyes stare into my dark ones, and I smile and reach out, touching the back of her hand gently. You're not getting me in trouble. If I don't handle this properly, I could get me in trouble. Just believe me, I'd be proposing we do something about this right now if it wasn't for the rules. I glance down at her leg. And the fact that, young lady, you still have a good deal of healing to do. I give her a wink and a smile, trying to reassure her, but she's blushing again and looking down at her hands suddenly. Her shyness makes her even more adorable. She's beautiful and doesn't seem to know it, and her modest, unassuming manner is refreshing. You're right, she says with a tiny smile. I know I'm going to see you again since we're going to be beat Campbell in court. But I, well, I date you even if we had to keep it a secret for a while. I feel that tentative warmth again. I know I'm not much of a romantic, especially after all the darkness I had to wade through back in London. But I'd love to try it with her anyway. Maybe. If things go well. I'll keep that in mind, I tell her, staring into her eyes. But right now, you need to go back and get some rest. Weeks pass and winter really starts to set in. I start to think about inviting Samantha for Christmas. Neither one of us has a family anymore, herself by accident and myself by necessity. Samantha and I plot against Dr. Campbell. We work as a team, putting together a timeline of events and collecting paperwork, including her pre-hospitalization medical record, which shows the lack of thorough testing. We get a copy of the prescription for the calcium channel blocker that Campbell had given her, which likely worsened her condition, and we put a plastic bag with the bottle in it in our growing evidence folder. We have dinner together. I try to impress her at first, but we both turn out to be steak, pizza, and Chinese takeaway people, so I lay the wines and foie gras aside, always hated them both anyway, and we focus instead on enjoying our time together. 
We always say good night, and I always have to fight to keep it from going further. She's healing first, and then after that, she's scrambling to catch up with classes. I try not to distract her, and bury myself in my work a bit to keep from being distracted myself. I find myself looking for Christmas gifts for her in jewelry catalogs online. I find something perfect and receive the wrapped box in the mail and hide it away in the top of my closet. Then I add a few things, wellies in her actual size and a good winter coat, and stash their wrapped boxes in the same place. Finally, on the afternoon of December 15th, we go to see a lawyer I hunted down who has won five cases against Campbell by himself. His name is Michael Chong, and he agrees right away to see what we have. He turns out to be a tallish, lean man with tan, wispy hair that is thinning on top and small black eyes that remind me of coppers. The resemblance distracts me, and I avoid looking at his eyes unless he is talking directly to me. Instead, I focus on his little silver holly sprig tie tack. Samantha sits next to me in a plain navy blue dress that is apparently her best, hiding a fraying section of the sleeve cuff under her wrist. She looks very nervous, and I reach for her hand and hold it as the lawyer looks over our folder. This detrimental prescription, the lack of any response to an emergent situation involving chest pains, and the lack of essential testing all point toward an extremely dangerous level of negligence. He turns the last page and sets the folder aside with a small smile. It's entirely consistent with the other cases I have taken against Dr. Campbell. So you'll take the case? Samantha sounds both worried and eager. Oh, absolutely. If I were you, I would highball your suit, say to the tune of one million dollars. Chances are that he will offer half that as a settlement. Samantha goes pale and her eyes bulge. I chuckle and hug her gently. Don't sell yourself short, dear, I purr in her ear. He did greatly endanger you and extend your suffering. She nods and sets her jaw, looking up at the lawyer. I'm going with your advice on this one. He sits back with a smile and looks between us. Good, good. I'll file the paperwork and we'll see what his lawyer's response is. I give her hand another squeeze behind the desk and she shoots me that small, brave smile. I squash another surge of desire. All right then. Let's go home and celebrate. Samantha my stomach flutters as I sit next to Damon in his fancy black car again. We're driving from my dorm to the highway, cruising under temporary archways of fake greenery and real icicles. Christmas lights and displays shine from every window and lamppost, and the sidewalks are full of bustling shoppers. Normally, the Christmas season gets me depressed because I've never had anyone to spend it with. Before meeting Damon, I'd planned to spend my holiday as one of the few people stuck in the dorms for the season. But instead, I'll be spending it with him. The last two weeks have been a tremendous thrill. Not only am I feeling better than I have in years, not only are we finally filing the lawsuit after a ton of work, but Damon and I are being romantic as hell, holding hands. It's all new to me, I've never been touched by a man before, and though we're not doing much yet, it's still amazing. But with the lawsuit and board complaint likely to shine a spotlight on the pair of us, the best I can expect until we win are some longing looks and a little tenderness. And none of that in public. It still makes me sad and frustrated. My feelings aren't rational, but it's sometimes like I'm a shameful secret he is keeping. I also feel sometimes that he isn't telling me the whole truth about himself, he's just too good to be true. The random calls from nowhere that he won't answer around me, and how tense he gets after them really make me wonder. And sometimes, he will start telling me a story about his life and then suddenly leave off, as if the story is wandering into parts of his life that he doesn't want to reveal to me. I start to suspect that he does have a wife or a steady girlfriend stashed somewhere. I suspect that I am being paranoid about things. He told me his reason for not getting serious with me yet. And still, I can sense that there's something he isn't telling me, something that might be even more important. So I'm thinking I'll try some of that sorbet stuff while we're in the hot tub, if you're into it. He has a gleam in his eye and a little curl to his lips. I don't have a bathing suit, I point out, and his lopsided smile widens as he takes the on-ramp onto the highway. 
We both go quiet as he merges with traffic and then starts moving left toward the fast lane. He's settled into the drive and is starting to answer when a white van roars up beside us and starts edging aggressively into our lane. Damon curses and pumps the brakes, letting the van in front of him before it can knock us into the guardrail. It ends up scraping along against the furrowed metal itself, striking sparks along one side. Oh my gosh. I gasp and turn to look at Damon. That didn't look like an accident. He scowls and grips the wheel, his whole expression and demeanor changing in an instant. I stare at him in horror as the pleasant, friendly, foul-mouthed and flirty doctor I know disappears in an instant beneath a cold, hard glare. Even when he speaks, his accent has thickened. Hold on. He takes advantage of an opening and swerves to the side, neatly maneuvering the car around the van and getting in front of it. The van speeds up, trying to attack again, but Damon floors it and the prowler leaps to life. The roar of the engine sends my heart racing in a way I have never associated with pleasure before, as an enormous thrill runs through my whole body. We leave the van behind within seconds, as the bulky, weaker engine vehicle reaches its limit. My terror dissolves in the thrill of escaping. He doesn't slow down or say anything at all until he's left the van far enough behind that we can no longer see it. That was not some random drunk, Damon finally growls, sounding furious about it. That was a targeted attack. I don't understand, I mumble, shivering in fear. Why would anyone be after me? They're not after you, sweetheart, except by association. He sounds resigned, his rough manner and accent only gentling now that he's speaking to me. They're after me. It's a tense drive back to his penthouse, and I'm too dizzy, baffled, and scared to ask too many questions until we're safely indoors. On the way up the elevator, he looks at me, and a touch of the old tenderness returns to his eyes. You all right? I guess I would be a lot worse if you weren't such a good driver, I breathe, not sure what else to say. But you owe me one hell of an explanation. He nods, his jaw working as he leans his head back against the wall of the elevator. Yeah. Suppose I've put this off for too long. We pick the chairs closest to the fireplace, and I stretch my hands toward it, feeling the chill and the shivers of fear fading at once. He brings us both tea with lemon, honey, and brandy, and waits until I've swallowed down my first cupful before he goes into his story. The whole time it's like he's become some gentler version of Mr. Hyde, rough, working class, hard-eyed, but only when he isn't looking at me. When he does look at me, his brown eyes go soft again and their gaze fills me with warmth. And that's the only thing keeping me going as I struggle to listen to his story. Samantha I told you the truth about being born to a nasty public housing apartment. And all the rest of it, I gave you a patchwork of truth with a lot of holes, I admit it, but there wasn't a lie among them. Damon sounds a little guilty like he's almost desperate to reassure me. But what I left out is, I didn't start out some fancy white hat doctor who goes around saving lives. That's my penance for what I did before. It's how I can live with myself now. He takes a long swallow of his drink and then refreshes it with straight brandy before setting the mug down. My dad's been doing a stint in Wandsworth prison for as long as I've been alive. I've never even met him. But he was still the head of the family business, because without his name, I would never have had any dealings with that world. What's the family business? I can guess, but I want to hear it from him. Well, my dad managed to get himself 40 years for a diamond heist. His younger brother, my uncle, was still knocking over banks and high-end shops, which meant he was in and out of jail as well. The difference was, he had a better lawyer and was usually out within a few months each time. So my mum and my aunt moved in together, and that made it me and my aunt's son, Copper, growing up like brothers. My uncle would come by for a few months, dig up cash for us from who knows where, and then get picked up for something and have another round behind bars. In between, he started teaching Copper and me things. How to lift a wallet, how to copy a key, how to crack a safe, and how to control a room during a robbery. Damon sits back and swallows down the contents of his mug, then lays it aside with a sigh. There were no jobs for young lads when I started out, and no money for college. 
When Copper came to me and said he had a driving job for me, I didn't know I would be driving a getaway car for him and his lads. But then there I was, right in the midst of it. He speaks frankly, making no apologies and no excuses. I got in too deep before I even realized just how badly off we all were. They were knocking over shops during football riots and breaking into cars during the holidays. I drove them and got them away and got a cut of the money for it. Copper kept telling me we were like Robin Hood, except this time, the poor we were giving to was us. I watch his face. The hard expression has gone bleak, replaced by a tortured look filled with regret. Some of the fear trickles out of my heart, but burning curiosity and a little wariness replace it. My mother hated it. She cried about it and begged me to stop. And I kept trying. Copper would beat me for making him look bad to the others, and I learned to fight properly, so he'd have a harder time doing it. He eyes the brandy bottle, then shrugs and takes a long pull from it, not giving a damn anymore. I'm still on painkillers or I would reach for it myself. As it is, I'm nursing the rest of my mug. Then Copper gets mixed up with these guys my uncle's been doing jobs with, and not a single one of them is any good. In fact, every last one is rotten. I beg him to leave with me, to just go, but he's in too deep. He licks his lips and turns toward the window wall, that sad empty look on his face making my heart ache. So they decide to graduate to bank jobs. And my uncle decides that this time, I'm going in. They need someone smart and steady-handed to crack the safe. I end up in even deeper. Somewhere around my third year of that, we're hitting a bank in Leeds. We end up faced with a safety door that slams down in front of the vault while I'm inside it gathering things up. And the idiot entry man Copper picked up on short notice sets the charges off too close to a gas pipe. I sit back, astonished, as he winces and nods. Wow. Did the whole building go up? Yeah, and then it went down. I wrote out the explosion and collapse in the vault, grabbed the two million in diamonds we had come for, and disappeared. I hated doing it, but I knew I'd be presumed dead, and that was my only chance to escape. I just stare at him, my mouth open in astonishment as I process this latest bit of information. You, dot you fled to America then? Got a new identity? Yeah. I did. I left everyone behind. Copper, my mom, my girl, let them all think I died. I came here, bought myself a new life, and laid down capital for this building which paid for itself while I put myself through medical school. He spreads his hands, sighing. I've kept my hands off of you because you're a sweet girl, really lovely, and you've had enough people messing up your life. I'm a miscreant, damn it. I've got phone calls from unknown London cell phones, and I've got unmarked vans trying to run me off the road. Someone's found me. He reaches out and cups the side of my face in his big hand so tenderly that it brings tears to my eyes. I don't deserve you, and sticking around is going to put you in danger. It's not that I don't care for you, Samantha. It's that I do, and I'm poison for you. Especially right now. It hurts. A shudder goes through me, almost a convulsion, while a stabbing pain runs through my chest. A sob escapes me, and the pain that flashes across his face at the sight of it only makes it worse. He saved my life twice. He's the only person I have ever had who has really given a damn about me, and I can't lose him, even if staying with him puts me in danger. I can't. Shit. He gathers me against his chest, his body tense and his heart beating fast. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. I know you've been through a lot even without me. Without you, I'd be dead. My voice comes out surprisingly calm and he freezes, then slowly looks down to meet my gaze. Twice, I remind him, before looking away shyly. Anyway, it's too late. Whoever tailed us onto the highway to attack us already knows I'm mixed up with you. He sighs and swallows, blinking rapidly. Damn. After a long thoughtful silence he mutters, I can try and keep you safe. But I don't know how I'm going to make up for dragging you into my problems. I take a deep breath, steadying myself against him, and then slide my hands up his chest as he looks into my eyes. You can start by making love to me. Samantha 
When I come out of the shower, I'm reluctant to dress, but without anything else to wear unless I raid his closet, I shove myself back into my dress and step into my shoes. Letting out a sigh, I look down at Damon sleeping quietly, Dot and then move past him toward the living room and the kitchen beyond. It's just barely before dawn, and I'm still almost too sleepy to walk properly, let alone think. I notice a washing rig on the other side of the window, with a big man in a jumpsuit and hard hat standing on it, doing something to the glass. Whatever it is makes a little screeching sound as he finishes up. Then I hear a sharp snap. I don't realize that he's using a glass cutter until a big circle of glass falls into the room and shatters, letting in a blast of freezing wind. I let out a scream of shock and horror, and then the big man bulls through the gap and grabs me, clapping one giant gloved mitt over my mouth. Damon Samantha's cut-off cry of panic and horror sends me shooting up from a sound sleep, and adrenaline burns through my veins like cold acid. I leap up and run naked into the living room, just in time to see the huge hole in my window and the window washing rig dropping out of sight. The last thing I see is a huge figure wrapping her in his gigantic coat as she struggles in his grip. Wrapping her in his coat? Panic and confusion warring in me, I barely notice the cold biting at my naked skin. I yank on my clothes, throw on my shoulder holster with my .357 in it, and yank my leather jacket on over that. I grab my keys and am stuffing my phone in my pocket when it rings suddenly. It's a London phone number. I pick it up at once, and I know who it's going to be. Copper you jerk. What the hell are you up to? If you hurt that girl. Nobody's getting hurt, comes the rumble, with an even deeper and thicker accent than I remember. That's why I'm handling it and not dad's goons. He suddenly loses a lot of his bravado. She's fine, Denny. I just can't guarantee she'll stay that way long. There's a thread of tension in his voice that I notice even through my rage. You've got one chance to explain yourself, copper. I grab my repelling gear from my gym, run out to the stairway, and clip my harness around my hips and thighs. The end of the rope clips to the heavy pipework safety rail. In the background, I can hear Samantha's muffled cries as she tries to reason with her giant of a kidnapper. The engine for the cleaning rig putters in the background, and I can hear the ropes creak as it lowers. It has to go slowly in this wind. Copper, I'm warning you. I'll put a bullet in you to get her back. What me? Damn Denny, I thought you were some fancy life-saving doctor now. But his mockery comes out in a weak tone. I am. Which should tell you how much she means to me. Don't think I'd feel good about it but you're not giving me a choice. I test my lines and the harness fastenings and make sure to strap in my pistol securely. I hook one leg over the railing. Copper, this isn't like you. You've never dragged innocent people in like this and don't tell me you've changed that much. So what is going on? Final chance. He takes a deep breath and lets it out at once. Dad sent us round to chase up a rumor that you'd been seen in Chicago. It's me and Ben. When he found out you're alive, Dad lost his shit. He's got my family, Denny. Either I pull that two million out of your hide, or he'll get rid of his own granddaughter. She's too, Denny. Damn. Suddenly, everything in my world makes sense again. It's just you and Ben? Ben may have to die. Otherwise, he'll be sticking around making a nuisance of himself, reporting back to Copper's dad if anything happens. I can't believe that everything shifted so fast on me. I should have seen the signs. That man on the rooftop almost two weeks ago, copper with a pair of binoculars, looking in on me. Making sure it was me. Yeah. But if you mess this up, the pressure in his voice speaks volumes. I scoff. I could pull two million out of my vault right now. Your dad's an idiot. You could have gotten four million out of me with a polite phone call. I know I caused trouble running off. I just had to get out of the life. I look down the shaft of the stairwell. Don't hang up. I stuff the phone in the zipper pocket on the front of my jacket, grab the line, and step out into space. Repelling in dress shoes is a bit of a trick, but I didn't have time to grab my climbing shoes. I make a fast descent, 
bounding from railing to railing while the line pays out, pausing to retrieve and reclip it twice. In under a minute, I'm on the ground floor. I run out, leaving the harness behind and pulling out my phone. You there? I growl as I race out through the lobby and around toward the side of the building that he's descending. Where is Ben? White van, is all I hear before I see the slightly battered van that had attacked us on the highway go roaring past down the side alley. I run after it, pulling my pistol. If you let him hurt her I'll shoot you both, I snap and hang up. Negotiations are over. Now I have to make sure crazy, trigger-happy Ben doesn't decide to put a bullet in my girl before Copper and I can get him under control. I see them up ahead. The van is parked under the window washing rig, which is slowly descending. Praying that I'll make it in time, I run toward them faster than I ever have in my life. Samantha I'm screaming and fighting with all my strength when the enormous man on the descending scaffold suddenly grumbles something about how I'll freeze to death out here. Before I know what's happening, he's wrapping me in his coat, shocking me into stillness. It's then that I get my first look at him. Copper. Are you Damon's cousin, Copper? My head spins. Damon talked about this man being torn between his father's crime legacy and their own desire for something better. But I never expected to be face to face with him. That's me, the giant grumbles. Sorry about that. If it's any comfort, this isn't anything personal at all. You just yanked me out of a penthouse window and are kidnapping me by transporting me down the side of a high-rise. How am I not supposed to take it personally? I look around, terrified to be trapped on this windy, fragile thing. He snorts and holds me by the scruff, the heavy coat trapping me as much as warming me. I see him put a cell phone to his ear. Yeah. I've got her. I'll send the ultimatum once I'm far enough down the building that he can't shoot me. He listens and his face twists into a scowl. Yeah, well, you tell my father that if he lays a finger on either of them, I'll destroy him myself. Hate this whole business. Some more listening, and then he hangs up the phone and calls Damon, but immediately get a huge hand clapped over my mouth again. But listening to the conversation relaxes me slightly. Damon seems to be getting through to this guy, who isn't even acting of his own will. When he hangs up, he removes the hand from my mouth, but looks at me forbiddingly. No more screaming. Ben has a hair trigger. Look, I say hastily. I get that you're being pushed into this, but you should really rethink your approach. Damon owns this building. If you want two million, he could probably just put it together for you. Yeah, and were it up to me I'd say yes in a trice. But my dad wants Denny to suffer. Now, if you're careful and do as I say, it shouldn't be a problem. He looks down and scowls as a van roars around the corner and drives up to stop underneath us. There he is now. I see him. My heart sinks. The last thing I need is to be stuffed in a van and driven away before Damon can even get down, stairs. The first thing that pops into my head when Damon races around the corner with his cell phone in one hand and his gun in the other is how the hell did he get down faster than we did? A man opens the van sunroof. He's red-headed, stocky and scarred across his cheeks and has a pistol in his hand as well. Hurry up! We have to get out of here before someone notices us. Then he sees where Copper and I are looking as we descend, and he curses in such a thick Irish accent, I can't catch what he's saying. And then, in a moment I'll never forget for the rest of my life, however long that may be, he turns and fires on Damon. With reflexes faster than I've ever seen, Damon ducks behind a dumpster and shoots back. The man grabs his arm, gasping, Dot but just switches his gun to the other hand. You called him and warned him, you jerk the redhead yells up at us, and then he's pointing that huge pistol up at the two of us. I'll get rid of you and the girl both. Don't do it, Ben. Copper booms and shoves me behind him. I stare at his back, dot and down at Damon. In that moment, I truly understand how he and Damon could have been raised as brothers. Three guns go off as one, and the giant in front of me grunts in pain and doubles over. I grab him and haul him back with all my strength before he can fall off the scaffold. 
Once I have him safe and am putting pressure on his chest wound, I look down and see that though copper missed, Damon's bullet found its mark. I glance at the red-haired corpse and then go back to tending to my reluctant kidnapper. Copper. Damon yells, having seen the big man take the bullet for me while he gets rid of the shooter. You still with us? Damn, Copper gasped. Yeah, but don't know how long I'm for it. Think he hit me in the heart. You couldn't talk if he'd hit you in the heart. Damon climbs up to us. I've called for an ambulance. Let me do the talking once they get here. Well, it hurts like it. The big man's scared. Can't blame him, I was on Brink too recently. Even though he dragged me out of a window in the middle of the night, I grab his hand so he'll have someone's to hold. Well, you're in luck because I happen to specialize in fixing hearts. Damon takes off his jacket so we can wrap copper in his own coat. We hear the wail of the ambulance siren. Damon's credentials get fast results. Yeah, he's not kidding. He just fixed mine a few weeks ago. I smile down at the bruiser, whose eyes twinkle weakly. Really? Well, that's really something, he mumbles. As he starts passing out, he says to Damon, Denny, if I don't make it. Call your mother. It's Christmas. I will, Damon promises, slipping an arm around me as we wait for the ambulance crew. Epilogue Damon I did one better, once my emergency microsurgery fixed the tear in Copper's aorta. I brought everyone over for the holidays. Copper couldn't be moved for at least another month, and he was missing Molly, whom he'd married once she'd gotten over me, and their little daughter. His father managed to get himself arrested for drunk driving, on his way back to where he was keeping Copper's family hostage. Back he went to jail, and this time, when his lawyer heard what he had done, he refused to help him get free again. I have a few bruises from where Copper gave me a decent smack for a wounded man, and then my mother, and then Molly, all for making them cry over my empty grave. I've promised to make it up to them, and make sure none of them wants for anything enough to ever turn to crime again. And then, I made sure to introduce Samantha properly to all of them. And so now my mother, Copper, Molly, and Tiny Maeve are gathered round a hastily purchased Christmas tree, stockings hung with presents on my mantle. It took a small fortune to get them all here and arrange everything, but I think it's worth every penny. Samantha sits beside me, holding my hand, and she smiles shyly as she talks with the others. It may cause some scandal in the medical community when I marry her. But I've gone and done something stupid, exchanging the nice locket I got her for credit toward an engagement ring. It's moving fast, and I don't mind if she makes me dangle on a long engagement, but I've never been so sure of anything, especially now that I've got my family back. And so as I hold hands with her, the last gift of the evening sits in a velvet box in my back pocket. A rose gold ring with a heart-shaped pink diamond. I'm hoping that she likes it and the whole idea. I guess we'll see. For this time my life, or at least my happiness, is in her hands. I trust she'll take good care of it. The End Thank you for listening to this audiobook. Audio copyright 2023 BFA Publishing. Please like and subscribe to support this channel. It helps more than you know.